What's up friends and welcome back to my channel. Over the past few weeks, I've been running a series of experiments using my NutriSense CGM to see how my body responds to different foods, stress, and hot and cold therapy. And I've gotta say, the results have been pretty profound. So in this video, I'll share what factors cause the biggest changes to my glucose levels, why timing of carbs matters, and why not all keto bars are made equal. But first, if you're new here, welcome. My mission is to help you achieve success without sacrificing your health or happiness. I do product reviews weekly, so if you're into this, click that subscribe button and join the type A tribe. Now, before we kick things off, if this is your first time tuning in, or you aren't familiar with how a continuous blood glucose monitor works, I highly suggest you check out my first video in which I did a deep dive on all of that. And I will include a link in the description below. And let me preface this whole video by saying that food and stress really impacts everyone's glucose levels differently. What may move the needle for me may not for the next person, which is why I am such a big proponent of everyone really taking their health into their own hands and doing their own types of experiments. And you may also notice that in this video, my glucose levels are a lot lower than when I did my first NutriSense CGM video about a month ago. I'm actually on a very special strain of a probiotic by the company Pendulum, and it has dramatically decreased my glucose levels over the past month. And so my follow-up video where I talk to the founder of this company will be coming out next week, so make sure to stay tuned for that. So now let's dive deep into my data as we first take a look at food order and timing. Endless breadsticks and bread baskets are a staple at so many restaurants, as are high carb appetizers. But what happens to your insulin levels when you indulge in these before your meal? Enter my first experiment. So I recently came across a study from Weill Cornell Medical College, and it looked at the timing of carbs and its impacts on post-meal glucose levels. So in this study, patients ate a high carb meal, and in this case, it was ciabatta bread and orange juice. They then waited 15 minutes before following it up with veggies, protein, and fat. They then reversed the order, starting with the veggies, protein, and fat, waited 15 minutes, and then had the high carbs. And what they found was that when carbs came second in order, glucose levels dropped by nearly 37% at the 60 minute mark. Now granted, this test was done on patients with type two diabetes who were also taking the drug metformin. Now I am not taking the drug metformin and I do not have type two diabetes, but I thought if it worked for them, hey, why not give it a shot? And so I replicated the experiment at home using half a sweet potato, butter lettuce, egg whites, avocado, and olive oil. And I measured everything out very precisely. On day one of the experiment, I started with the protein, fat, and veggies, and then followed it up with the carbs 15 minutes later. And as you'll see here, my glucose levels didn't really peak until the one and a half hour mark where it actually capped off at 132. On day two of the experiment, I reversed the order, starting with the sweet potato and then following it up with the rest of the meal 15 minutes later. And what I saw was a huge spike within the hour with my glucose levels peaking to 145. Now for reference, on most nights when I have a low carb meal, my glucose levels only get up to the upper 90s, maybe low 100s. So as you can imagine, this was a pretty big jump for me. Now I wasn't totally fasted like they were in the study, but I started out both experiments around the same glucose levels just to kind of keep things balanced. And so what this shows me is that carb timing did have an impact and that starting my meal high in carbs not only spiked my glucose levels higher, but it also did so in a shorter amount of time. Now moving on to hot and cold stress, as we take a look at my experiments with an ice bath and sauna therapy. I've heard a lot about the purported benefits of hot and cold therapy on things like reduced stress, decreased inflammation, and even elevated mood. So I was curious if these therapies might also have an impact on my glucose levels as well. So I tested out my ice experiment on one of the hottest days of the year where temperatures were around 105. And of course I decided to be an overachiever and go for a two mile run before jumping into the ice bath. And what I noticed was a huge spike in my glucose levels, up to 151, nearly 10 minutes after submerging in the cold water. Within the hour, it dropped down to 100 pretty quickly and then stayed consistently low throughout the evening, dipping down to 59 around midnight, which for the record is 
one of my lowest glucose levels to date. I then replicated the experiment a week later, but instead of going for a run, I just went straight into the five minute ice bath without a warm up. And within 10 minutes, my glucose levels dropped from 75 to 58. So with two ice baths and two very different numbers, I wasn't really sure what was going on. So I reached out to my nutritionist at NutriSense and she explained that that spike of 151 was most likely due to the hot run and not the ice bath. And she even said that my glucose levels probably dropped faster because of the ice bath than if I hadn't taken one. And my second experiment without doing heat first really illustrates the impacts of cold therapy on lowering your glucose levels almost immediately. But I gotta say, jumping into a freezing cold bath without being warmed up first isn't exactly a walk in the park. So I'll probably be reserving those for my carb loading days only. Now on the flip side, when it came to sauna therapy, I actually saw my glucose levels shoot up really quickly, likely due to the heat stress. On one of my experiment days, I saw my glucose levels jump from 86 to 117 within the half an hour before coming back down. The same thing pretty much happened on another day with a 30 minute sauna, where I saw my glucose levels jump from 86 to 116 within the half an hour. And then it came down pretty quickly thereafter. And for the most part, whenever I did do a sauna session, I saw my levels stay pretty consistently low in the 80s or so throughout the overnight hours. And I did compare my sauna evenings with some control evenings where I didn't do anything and I saw that it took significantly more hours for my glucose levels to drop back down on the nights that I didn't do sauna therapy. And so what this tells me is that, yeah, sauna therapy did have an impact on helping lower my glucose levels, although it wasn't quite as extreme and fast as an ice bath. And finally, we come to the glucose face-off between three very popular brands of keto branded bars on the market. Keto Bar by Perfect Keto, Bulletproof Collagen Bar by Bulletproof, and then the Quest Protein Bar by Quest. And here's where we get into some interesting numbers. So I tried all three bars on three different days, starting out at the same glucose levels. So on the day I ate the Quest Protein Bar, which has one gram of sugar and three grams of sugar alcohols, I found that my glucose levels spiked 21 points. It jumped from 78 to 99 within a half an hour. And the Bulletproof Collagen Bar did a similar thing. This one has one gram of sugar and one gram of sugar alcohols. And this one spiked my glucose levels 17 points, jumping from 84 to 101 before coming back down at the hour mark. But the Perfect Keto Bar did absolutely nothing to my glucose levels. Containing one gram of sugar and no sugar alcohols, my glucose levels started at 91, stayed at 91, and then came back down to 85 an hour after eating the bar. Now when looking at the ingredients, all three of these bars contain just one gram of sugar. So what the heck happened here? They also all contain stevia, almonds, and cocoa butter. But what the perfect keto bar contains that the other two do not is cinnamon. And so my theory here is that the cinnamon ingredient may be coming into play in helping keep my blood sugar levels in check. And both the Quest and Bulletproof bars also contain erythritol and unsweetened chocolate. So those could be factors as well. Anyway, it was a really interesting and surprising find, and I highly encourage if you're interested to replicate these kind of experiments on your own using either a CGM or a blood glucose monitor. And finally, let's talk about meditation and the impact of stress and glucose levels. And I've gotta be honest here, I did several 20 minute meditations before bed over the course of a week, and I've gotta say, I really didn't see any significant change in my glucose levels overnight. And even when I experimented with meditations at other times of the day, it was really hard to quantify the impacts because of course, food is a huge factor. So unfortunately, I don't really have anything conclusive to either support or deny the impacts of meditation on your glucose levels, but I would love if you guys have any thoughts or feedback for me to leave it in the comments below. I'm happy to try out a new experiment. I'd love to hear from you guys. And make sure to keep it locked in right here for next week's episode in which I do my full review of Pendulum and how it has drastically decreased my glucose levels. You won't wanna miss that one. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you learned something, if you liked this video, please make sure to give it a big thumbs up 
And if you're not already subscribed, make sure to hit that subscribe button and click that notification bell so you get notified each week when I drop a new video. And until then, I will catch you on the next one.